everyone. Nice to meet you all. This is Alex at the mic and uh, John. He has a mic too. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm John. John. I'm, I'm founder of Morsex. That's uh, it. I also. About me. Uh, yeah, today John will talk, mostly he. Um, I will act as a full stack programmer because I have this background. And I'm going to ask John everything about Mars. And though I'm into this Mars community for like six months, I still don't get it entirely. I have a lot of questions. And today I'm going to ask it to John and gladly, I hope, reply everything. Some questions may sound a little offensive or disarming. So sorry for that in advance. It's really controversial because Mars is doing something new to the world. And uh, many people don't believe in that. And so get yourself prepared. And the first thing I want to ask you is about you. Who are you? Can you please tell me a few minutes about your background? Yeah, I've been building software uh, since 2002. So I started building software when I was in school and then I uh, went to study computer science at the age of 15. I started university. I finished that when I was 19. Then I went for masters. I got two masters in interaction design and computer science. And my, my bachelor uh, work was around uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, I have built uh, this program that could convert the handwritten pictures into the uh, computer text. So it was used mainly uh, by the students who were writing the lectures on the paper, and then they would use my software to actually convert that into a uh, digital format. And then you could search for stuff, because that was important, that you could search for, for the text, for the topics in the lectures. So I was in, mm -hmm. into programming uh, for quite some time, like 20 years, and uh, I loved uh, artificial intelligence uh, back then, and um, I did quite a lot of work on that. But then in 2010, I started uh, doing more generic stuff. So I uh, founded outsourcing firm that was building apps and websites and SaaS portals for clients uh, in Norway. Uh, and it was quite high demand. So uh, we were doing really well. We grew to 50 people almost in a in, in few years. And uh, we're making a lot of money on that business because it was just a start of that uh, big trend on building outsourcing firms. But two years after, I realized that I really don't like to sell ours. I really like to own the ideas or the I, I like to own the results of my work. So I engaged heavily into startups from 2011 or 12. And since then, I was building only startups and I was building my own startups I was joining other people's startups as co-founder. Mostly, I was doing CTO role, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I did very little of management. Mostly, I was coding myself or coding mm -hmm. with other coders being their leader. So I wasn't really a CTO who just manages and gives the tasks. I was actually doing this stuff. But then uh, somewhere in 2015, 16, I started doing other things like design, fundraising, uh, uh, CEO role. So... Mm -hmm. And by now, uh, I think I've done pretty much everything you can do in a startup, uh, mostly tech, but also everything else, accounting, uh, agreements, uh, fundraising, uh, pitching, selling, marketing, everything. And in 2018, uh, I came up with this idea uh, that was back then uh, just, uh, you know, it was not having a name even. So the idea was that I want to simplify my own job so in all the startups i was building software so uh it was a big pain uh to you know build the software it was expensive to hire developers and software would have a lot of bugs etc and for me as a person who was seeing a lot of software being developed at the same time i saw one mm -hmm. clear possibility there which was uh that a lot of the things were the same in all the projects i was involved in uh, like, uh, I think half of the projects were just the same, like login window, admin portal, user profile, search, you know, a lot of the things. But we would have to create from scratch every time. And then I came up with this idea that I have to build a, a way 
to share the code be beyond having libraries. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. long story short. Uh, now I'm here uh, with all this uh, experience building full time uh, Mars. And that's, that's I, my background. I, I guess a lot of programmers came up with the same idea. I want to make my code reusable. We may use some kind of software to store snippets and then copy paste them or create a kind of UI library or their own package or something. But since you had a bigger experience in your life, you made more projects than an average programmer. So your passion in reusing code differs. And I guess your approach differs too. So what's Mars sex? <laughs> yeah, what's different uh, here? You're right. Like people were trying to reuse code uh, since the code was invented. Uh, they were doing uh, libraries and uh, their stock stack overflow with the uh, snippets and uh, uh, there are these large UI components, etc. But the main problem with this world of SDKs, libraries, and uh, code that you can copy and paste is that uh, in real life, if you look into real project, you just take an average project and you actually evaluate uh, how much code is written and how much is reused, you will be shocked that most of it is written from scratch, like 80%, 90%, sometimes close to 100%. Um, and I was wondering why, but, but actually the answer came quite quite clearly to me because I was one of the people who was who was trying to use the libraries in every project. I, like, for example, we were building this cinema app and we, we, we had to have stories there. And I said to developers, there must be a GitHub uh, library that does stories on Swift and on, on Kotlin. There must be, right? Well, we found quite quite many of them. But all of them had the same uh, problem. They were all written by hobbyists who just spent some time, built something. Mm -hmm. It kind of works, but has a lot of bugs. It's a long list of bugs. Nobody really fixes them that fast. Uh, it goes slow. So, and then developers tell to me, like, you know, this thing is not finished. Like, I can't really use it. And, and there's little documentation. And every library has their own way of building it, their own way of consuming. So you, you may use one or two, but you can't use 30 or 40 uh, libraries for every use case you have. Uh, so we ended up by trying some libraries, but mostly relying on our own work uh, because it's just difficult to do this in practice. So in theory, it's interesting. In practice, not. But even bigger issue here is that all libraries are targeting either front-end or back-end, while mm -hmm. uh, the real software is always full stack. Like if you look at the typical SaaS projects or mm -hmm. apps, uh, like what you need, you need the whole full stack feature. Like if you need stories, like stories have to be generated, stored, and connected somehow to the database, right? So th this content has to be stored mm -hmm. and being, it has to be created. And my idea was quite simple. So the first prototype I made with Mars was that uh, I made this uh, this little framework for full stack libraries. That was like the first uh, early MVP where where you could actually mm -hmm. import the SDK that would come not only with front end but but with front end and back end. So it would combine multiple languages. So it was SDK with uh, the front end language and the back end language for for the Swift or Kotlin and the, and the front end for the uh, for JavaScript and, mm -hmm. and et cetera. But then the problem was that it was really complicated to put the libraries into traditional IDEs, into traditional workflow, because every library needs research in order to be installed. Like it's mm -hmm. not like you, you need one minute to install a library. It takes time mm -hmm. to understand it, to put it in, to connect all the pieces. It, it, it never just works out of the box. And, and that's a problem because there are like 10 libraries you want to try and you don't want to spend time on, on all of them. So then I thought like I have to make it simple to try full stake libraries. So my idea was actually evolving step by step. So first was that I need full stack libraries. The, uh, the second that mm -hmm. the libraries have to be standardized so that people understand them uh, quickly. Like it, it's kind mm -hmm. of, they all look the same 
they do different things, but they have to look the same and the, the code wise have to be easy to understand. Uh, and then the, the third thing is that people have to be uh, able to try in seconds because developers are uh, always willing to try out different things. And if it works, they use it. But if you need to spend a day to try it out, they won't even try. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those were three pieces where we started Mars. So around the code reusage. Yeah. We've done a lot mm -hmm. of other things after, but that was kind of the uh, genesis of it. And so this is the core idea. I want the code to be reused. So we created these two concepts. And what's Mars? Uh, is it a website or application or a method methodology? What's that? Uh, Mars is born out of the of this uh, concept that uh, you could actually call this full stack libraries microapps. So it's a concept of microapps where mm -hmm. where the application the end application, it can be a mobile app, website, you know, an app on TV, like any kind of software uh, may consist of micro apps. Because before Mars, uh, you would have to build it out of uh, the, the words available in the coding language, right? Like using mm -hmm. if and, and switch and etc. So that's what you did before. Then we got mm -hmm. this uh, libraries such as... Um, you know, this network and libraries, etc. that simplified the life. So you would have to write less code and you use some mm -hmm. of those libraries. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot more room left there, right? And then we came up with the idea that microps can solve the missing piece of the problem uh, where basically mm -hmm. the only work, what the only work the developer should actually do, in our opinion, is mm -hmm. build the business logic. Uh, and the micro apps should supply all the features that they operate with, right? That's the ideal way. That's the utopia where you want to build a project, you go in, you pick 25 micro apps that cover every part of your project, you glue them together, you, you write some code for the business logic, and the thing is working. And the good thing here is that since you don't build the micro apps yourself, you use the micro apps built by mm -hmm. others who put a lot of time into it and that's they make a living on it, then the quality is really high. So, you know, if you take the micro app for authentication, it has all possible ways to mm -hmm. enter the, the the account, like like 25 ways. Mm -hmm. So you you pick one or two, but it has all of them, right? And, and you don't have to maintain it. If something changes on Google API for Google login, mm -hmm. you don't have to change it. They will fix it for you. And that's like mm -hmm. Utopia. But then we realized mm -hmm. that uh, in the real world, uh, the software is always dynamic and the requirements mm -hmm. change and the microps might not be up to date. You might come up with some great idea for the uh, login window that's not present in the, in the micro, right? And how do we solve it? In the, mm -hmm. in the library world, you can solve it. Uh, like people don't really go into the libraries and change them because it's really complicated to understand the library because it's very random way of creating li libraries. Like only the creators understand it because they picked certain code style and, and, and certain patterns. Well, with microps, we thought like first, uh, we make it super simple for you to uh, reuse microps. And mm -hmm. the other thing that we have to make even simpler is modifying microps because we don't believe that any of the micro app can eventually uh, fulfill your needs. And mm -hmm. that's why in order to not to fail when your requirements grow, we made it really simple for you to modify the micro app without a big hustle so that you have 30 micro apps and you can change all of them and that all happens in one place. So that was like step number two. Like we, mm -hmm. we realize that we have to build our own IDE, our own developer environment, because we didn't want people to jump from 25 projects in VS Code in order to change the micro apps, you know, compile them, uh, upload them to NPM, you know, download. Like it, 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 it's a hustle. It's, it's impossible, right? We wanted that mm -hmm. to be real time. Like I'm, I'm using micro apps. I can change the micro apps. I can change my own project and I can change the ID. So the end result, what we got there was quite fascinating that developers could change everything starting from their project to micro apps and to Mars platform itself. Mm, I understand what you say uh, is a lot of concepts. 
it's a big complex thing and it's hard to imagine that it reminds me something like ide but it's not just ide it reminds me some concept of microservices but it's not just a bunch of microservices it's something new something the world never seen before can you please share your screen and just show the mars uh, because for me it's easier to see something i'm a visual perception person uh, if you could really just wanna... <laughs> i wasn't prepared to share my screen honestly yeah i i can understand that um, but uh, just a little app you're working on right now maybe you could just a few lines and the interface, if it's possible, of course. <laughs> I'm not forcing yes. you. What I'm afraid that people are going to see the URL and they're going to bombard you... our, our dev URL. Oh, I understand that. You can yeah. use Safari. It it can hide uh, address bar, but it's that a lot of hassle. You can just do it later. Yeah. But let's keep it on the uh, imaginary uh, sphere uh, for now, okay. but, you know, to, to simplify, <laughs> Focus uh, everybody. <laughs> yeah, to simplify into one sentence, what Mars mm -hmm. is, you know, some things you can't simplify to one sentence, right? But yeah. if you have to, I would say this: that <clears throat> Mars is a is a low code platform mm -hmm. that lets you operate with micro apps to build your software. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is not that far from the concept of microservices, but if you mm -hmm. you know dig into microservices, in microservices the idea is not that you use a lot of microservices built by others. The idea is that you build microservices <clears throat> and you connect them together, right? So it kind of it sounds mm -hmm. the same, but it is very different. And the core idea in mm -hmm. Mars that mm -hmm. it's a local platform where you build your software using microps, and the mm -hmm. microps aren't built by you. It can mm -hmm. be built by you, but mm -hmm. the microps are the primary businesses of other developers, you know, uh, who are like spending uh, mm -hmm. days and nights mm -hmm. building those microps. And because of mm -hmm. that, you can trust the quality. You can trust that uh, the microps will be fixing their their issues and and errors and bugs quite fast, comparing to open mm -hmm. source regular world where it's a hobby and nobody gonna mm -hmm. fix something very yeah. fast because you ask them because you you're not paying them right. And here mm -hmm. uh, we create certain uh, model where where there is high incentive for the micro app builders uh, to improve their micro apps. So it's a low code platform where you can mm -hmm. build your mm -hmm. software using micro apps and save a lot of time mm -hmm. because you reuse the micro apps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understood. So it's a new platform with its own ID and its own list of components, so-called micro apps, which are full stack micro apps, right? Correct. And the micro apps aren't built by uh, the platform itself. Micro apps mm -hmm. are crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. It, it comes mm -hmm. from the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds really ambitious. Ambitious, you know. You want of the community to build like thousands of microbes. How could that be possible? What's your plan? I think uh, there is quite some uh, quite some gap to fill here. So there are a lot of uh, people who do that already. Like there are thousands uh, of people or building mm -hmm. open source projects. There are thousands of people who are building SDKs, libraries, uh, component libraries. So there are a lot of them. Some mm -hmm. of them do it for fun. Some of them do it for their own project. Some of them do it uh, to make money on that. Uh, so we see that developer world is actually doing that in some form. Right? What's missing in that form they're having now? Like what's the main problem uh, with developers uh, you know, trying to make a business out of the code because this is exactly that, right? Like this mm -hmm. business is not about marketing. It's not about uh, packaging. It's more about can you write good code that other developers want to reuse? Right? Uh, and there are a lot of developers with, with experience and with ambitions and they want to do that. But I don't think there is any good way for uh, doing that uh, right now. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people who are struggling with that and, mm -hmm. and that's why I think the demand is going to meet the supply. So uh, in, in, in Mars platform, we are making the platform where the users will be consuming the microbes, right? Uh, so by default, it's the platform that needs microbes. 
And if the platform needs micro apps, then there is demand for the micro mm-hmm. app. So then mm-hmm. we need the supply. And the supply has to come from developers who already supply similar stuff to the world in the form of mm-hmm. libraries, SDKs, etc. Mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. they don't necessarily make money and they don't necessarily get even the users, right? Like some of them do it for free, but they, they don't get the usage. And that's sad. And here mm-hmm. there is mm-hmm. a possibility to get the usage straight away and uh, because the whole platform is kind of made tailored for that. Now, it, mm-hmm. it's similar to if you're cutting uh, hair, uh, it's better to add yourself to a marketplace for, for the barbers. Like higher chance to be hired than to be on the marketplace with everything in the world, right? Same here. So it's, it's pretty much Mars will be the, the place where developers can monetize their code. We call it micro IP. So you don't have to create a lot of code. You can make really simple things, really small things, but and that can be uh, useful for others on the platform. Um, y- you know, I say this like uh, I I came up with this great quote uh, in the shower uh, one one day, and I will read that to you now. Uh, it's so short that I have to read it to get it right uh, because it was so so beautiful. Uh, Give me one second. So I say that mm-hmm. uh, Mars. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I say Mars. Uh, first version of Mars is that you don't have to write the code twice. So that was the first version of Mars. So, mm, yeah, so if you, if you write code, uh, and, and I was the guy who was building, you know, uh, projects uh, one after another. So I wanted to first solve the problem for myself, right? Like it wasn't the idea to push it to the world. And I thought like, how can I reuse my own code? Not other people's code, but my own code. So that's why the first version was don't write code twice. You wrote it once, now your library grows. So if you go farther, you have those things and uh, ready. So it means that every next project you build, you have more uh, microbes ready, waiting for you uh, to, to be used. Mm-hmm. And then the, the next version was that do not write the code that anyone else has already written, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because every day, every single person writes the code that's being written at the same time by other thousand developers and has been written by 10,000 developers yesterday, right? So basically, there's a lot of code in the world. I, I think you could say with confidence that 99% of the code in the world is duplicate. Right. At least 99. It might be 99.99. Right. It's a duplicate co- code because same as, same as text. Like you know, if, if you write any sentence and you Google that sentence, you're gonna find that sentence written almost in the same way. Right. Same with code. And now th- there is this project called Top Nine, I think, and they let you search uh, for code in all public GitHub ro- repositories. Try to search for anything, you, you basically find it, right? So, and the second version, do not write the code that anyone else has written. And uh, the next version of Mars, the future version, that's where we touch AI, where we're gonna come soon <laughs> in this talk, is that do not write code at all. Like, So write... that's getting interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me uh, interrupt you a little. Um, I have a lot of questions here in the chat, and one of them was show me the code. I accidentally deleted that, sorry. But uh, while you're talking about AI, and uh, to start your conversation with uh, more abstract questions like, uh, are we in an AI high bubble? Is it real or just hype and temporary? And while you're doing that, your speech, I would love to show Mars. Because I think this entire stream is like meaningless without just yeah a, sure yeah you, you have a, set, a little set demonstration of, uh, yeah you, uh, you can do that I understand I, I I will hide the address bar important to keep Mars private we don't have 
some privacy settings yet and it's dangerous to let people just go and use it. So I will share my screen and have a little play while you're talking about AI. That's why we are here. Why programmers will be uh, removed by AI? Is, it, is that true? Or it's just a clickbait and you should ban me? I don't think that's going to happen. Like, uh, basically, it's, it's the way to form the question. Like, is the question that programmers are going to lose their jobs? Okay. Well, who is the programmer? If the programmer is a person, I don't think the person is going to lose his job. I think, but the concept of programmer having a job doing programming might be gone. It's just the same people will be doing different things, not the things they, they, they did before. So I think we're going to see uh, that the developers are going to spend time building products, but they won't be writing the code as they did before. They will write some code, but there will be a lot less code, a lot more high-level code than was before. So that means that the developers who do not learn other things than writing code, they will be gone. Like, because there will be, for most of them, their job will be just easily replaceable by AI, not in 2024, today. Like today, you can do things with AI uh, that uh, you would have to hire developers to do before. Like it can do everything when it comes to the uh, front end, uh, HTML and CSS, like, like you know, the stuff you would need to have junior developer uh, to make it look pretty and to make it similar to Figma. Uh, you know, there are AIs that can convert Figma into the full running front end, right? And then you have to connect the back end. So does it mean that we don't need developers? No, it means that developers who only know how to write HTML, uh, like their job is automated already now right, mm. with AI. Uh, and then we go farther. By, by, by so, tools like Copilot? You mean by tools like Autocompilot, uh, auto completion? Yes, uh, by tools like Copilot and uh, Replit Ghostwriter, uh, they do not do it that well when it comes to UX. But if you, you know, it's it's like whenever somebody invented an engine for a car, it was clear that the car will happen, right? That was out of the question from that moment, right? Uh, obviously, the engine is very far from the car. You have to build the wheels, the steering wheel, and all those things. But it's obvious that it's going to happen. So I think uh, people have to think about AI the same way here. I see a lot of people trying to you know, uh, use AI and make it fail in some little case and, and then come back to me saying that, look, it failed, right? But you have to do the opposite. You have to try to see what it can do. And then think like, so you're doing 25 tasks a week. How many of these 25 tasks can AI do? Today, it can do maybe five. Like right today, if you know how to use it, you can do five out of 25 tasks using AI. Tomorrow, it will be six. Uh, next week, it will be seven. And eventually, it will be maybe not 25. It might be 23. But that's really changed the whole picture. Like if it's only two tasks left, how many developers you need? Right? You need a lot less for the project. So I think that will be happening. And uh, we don't have uh, any other uh, alternatives here. And I think uh, what we want to do with AI in Mars, uh, we want to be the place where we combine AI and code in a way that works the best. Because we see a lot of projects relying just on AI, uh, where the whole coding happens or there's no coding at all, it just generates stuff. And we all know that you know, we want to have control. Like having black box generating stuff is not that cool. Uh, so we invented one concept. I will just explain it re really short. I think it's really fascinating concept. Uh, like Mars is built out of micro apps. And the, uh, so we, we built a logic where every micro app has own AI model. So let's mm -hmm. say we have micro apps for reviews, 
uh, you want to have reviews on movies, on products, on people, on what, whatever. So there's Microsoft for reviews. If you need reviews in your project or if you need chat in your project, you just bring one of these microapps. Mm-hmm. And every microapp comes with its own trained model that knows this microapp really well. Mm-hmm. So now when you bring in microapp, you treat microapp more like a person with the code rather than just the code. So it's mm-hmm. it's almost like little uh, it's a project with a developer in front of it, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it's not a developer; it's AI. And you tell mm-hmm. that AI that uh, you want to try the micro app. It helps you to try. It helps you to understand. Uh, it connects it for you into your project. It looks at your project. It knows itself. It knows mm-hmm. your project. It connects. Because it's not obvious mm-hmm. how to connect. Let's say it's a AI, it's Minecraft for reviews. But what mm-hmm. should it review? Like where should you connect the reviews to? Let's say to movies. But it doesn't know, right? And you tell. Mm-hmm. So connect yourself to movies. And then it looks at your other micro apps, finds the movie micro app, and connects into the movie micro app. So basically, all micro apps are like these isolated instances with their own AI models. And you as a master, on top of it, you talk to all these models and fine tune them so that microps behave in the way you want and they get customized in the way you want. So it's not like you you ask Mars, create me a project and then something magically happens because like you can't really explain a project with text like that. Now, the, the software creation is not a process of making a spec you know, pushing it and then the whole thing happened. It's more like iterations, right? And that's mm-hmm. why we really like this concept with micro apps because micro apps let you iterate. You start with nothing and you think like, all right, like what do I want to build? Uh, I don't know what, what I want to build. Let, let's start having uh, by having uh, the user login and then you just bring it in. So basically you can iterate. AI mm-hmm. will save you time when you try to find the good micro apps for your case. But you have to think about your business logic. AI won't help you because uh, it's your idea. It's your creativity. Mm -hmm. So that's for you. But you don't have to, you you don't have to spend time reading the documentation of each micro app, right? You don't have to spend time uh, fixing the micro app so that it looks the way you want it to look. Like that can, Mm -hmm. that will be happening uh, through the natural language conversation with AI. You can, of mm. course, go into the code and do everything in the code. That's another cool thing. So basically, uh, we don't say that AI is going to remove all the work. Uh, it will save 90% of the time. And 10% of the work you'll have to do yourself. I don't. You're muted. You got new camera angle, and I don't hear you. Let's use the previous one. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. So the main difference between Mars AI and what's AI used for today in GitHub Copilot, in Replit Ghostwriter, is that AI inside Mars knows everything about every part of your application. It works not within a scope of your open file, like in exactly. GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot can't get access to your entire project. You can't tell it uh, refactor anything or you know change architecture of my entire application. But in Mars, you can do that because of what? How did you do that? Why GitHub, who has billions of dollars, can't do that? And you, John, sitting there, um, you can. Yeah, How? it's easy to answer what? this question of, because uh, there is one limitation of AI uh, is the size of the prompt, right? We all know it. Uh, it can get in like you know, 5,000, 10,000, maybe 16,000. There is a limit mm-hmm. there. And mm-hmm. uh, we nobody knows if that limit is going to grow uh, and if it's possible to make it unlimited. So right now there is some theory, but nobody knows. And it will take time. So in, in this world where now, that's the limit. And because of that limit, 
uh, you can't really apply AI to traditional software because traditional software has a lot of code. Even to do app has more code than uh, AI can digest. Even to do app, right? But any proper app has like a hundred times more code than it can digest. Um, mm -hmm. And why uh, why Mars can fix that? Uh, because in Mars uh, we created this uh, abstraction layer using micro apps. So we do not show all the code to AI. We show uh, all the micro apps to AI, and that's why a there is not so much to show. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and even developer doesn't really know exactly what's happening inside of the micro app and doesn't have to know. Same with AI. And because of that, uh, and also we have uh, a lot of AIs for every micro app. So basically we have one AI that's on top that's helping you to orchestrate micro apps. And it's easy for it to do it because uh, it doesn't operate with a lot of code. It operates with business logic just with the names and specifications of the micro apps, right? And that's not so much. Uh, and then if you want to change something within the micro app, you use another AI that's sitting inside of the micro app and that knows the code only inside of that micro app. And in the micro app, we, mm -hmm. has, we have a limit. So you can't build micro app that doesn't fit into the AI model. Right? So mm -hmm. if you build it larger than the model, you have to figure out mm -hmm. a way to uh, you know, uh, split it into two. Or, or you can have a micro app that has two micro apps inside. So that's how you can split the logic. And, and by doing so, uh, we ensure that every micro app can have AI in it, its own model that's fine-tuned, that, that knows all the usages of this micro app. So whenever you take this micro app anywhere, like you use this uh, reviews micro app, I used it, and 100 people used it, its AI is learning on all those usages. It's fine-tuning itself on all those usages. And now when the person mm -hmm. 101 comes in and tries to do something, this AI not just knows itself, it knows all the possible ways of using it. Uh, so in this model, it can suggest you a better way of using it than you would come up yourself even because it's aggregated knowledge on how everybody's using it. Right? And it's possible mm -hmm. for us, like we're not limited by the size of the AI models just because uh, we limit the size of the micro app uh, when it comes to the lines of code. So you can't make it longer than mm -hmm. X. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see the bright future when you can just ask AI to fine tune something, to plug in new API or integration, when you don't have to search through Stack Overflow to find out how this property of this package exactly, works. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it could save like thousands of hours. Yeah, I don't like to compare or, or talk ever about WordPress because nobody likes WordPress in the world. But if you look at the WordPress world, I think WordPress will come back from the grave because of AI, because they have a possibility for a similar thing. They have plugins, and uh, it's a pain in the ass to install the plugin, to update the plugin, and uh, to uh, improve it. And I saw projects where people built and improved plugins using AI, and it worked really cool. So I think uh, all the projects that are based on this you know, app architecture, like Shopify, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mars, uh, mm -hmm. Unity 3D, right? Like all mm -hmm. the projects that are abstracting away the complexity into little blocks, micro apps, whatever you call them, they mm -hmm. can be using AI and they will benefit the most. The least benefit going to be in mm -hmm. regular programming. That's why most programmers don't believe in AI and they are right. If you're writing code on Kotlin, for example, mm -hmm. or on Swift, nothing going to change for you on a big scale. Uh, you can use GitHub Copilot today. So that the thing has, has changed already. It works cool. Mm -hmm. Like you, it helps you to you know, finish the sentence when you write the, the text, right? Uh, so it's better than before. I think people get about twice as productive with, with Copilot uh, in average. 1.7 mm -hmm. uh, times productive. That's what they mm -hmm. estimated. That's cool. I think in projects like uh, Mars and like Unity 3D, like Shopify and, and, and similar, uh, people will mm -hmm. get a hundred times more productive. 
but um, if you, you claim that infrastructures uh, like WordPress or Shopify, which contain a lot of applications maintained by independent developers, will benefit from AI the most, why can't we just start making um, libraries like NPM modules, Python applications just smaller so AI can digest it and it will solve the problem? It yeah, that's a good idea. But I, I mean, that's what we did, right? So you, you can take existing world and adapt it. And that's what Mars is. So we just took existing world. We said uh, libraries have to be full stack. Because if it's not full stack, it won't work. AI has to see the whole picture. If it doesn't know what's going to be on the, on the back end, it will make some random things on the front end. So it has to understand, uh, see through the whole uh, you know, stack. Right? And mm -hmm. then uh, first thing you have to do, you have to make libraries full stack. Uh, and you can, you know, there, there are things like Django, for example, where that's kind of done right, in one way. So they will benefit as well. So I think there are a lot of places that will benefit. And almost mm -hmm. in all the technologies, there are, there are some sub tech sub platforms that do that kind of stuff. So we do it now for uh, for the web development and app development uh, on mm -hmm. the JavaScript world. So Mars is mostly based on JavaScript and JavaScript frameworks. So you can use, uh, you know, microps mm -hmm. can be built on React, Vue, Svelte, like whatever you want, that's JavaScript. And mm -hmm. I think the same thing is, will happen to other places like uh, Flutter and, and Swift and other languages. And I see this, that's happening. Mm -hmm. Like basically mm -hmm. the abstraction will be elevated everywhere. Like all programming, uh, if mm -hmm. you look at the history of, of programming, you now the progress of programming has always been towards increasing the abstraction layer. So mm -hmm. you know, first we programmed with zeros and ones, then we invented mm -hmm. uh, the uh, words, you know, like push <laughs> and uh, uh, right. uh, before that it was assembler where it was I don't remember exactly it was double double symbols where you could uh, you know do some little things and, and and then you get this uh, simple languages with the functions and then you get languages with classes and then you get languages with the libraries and now you have languages with frameworks with components where you can abstract things away into the component but the problem with components that come like if you look at React, for example, that it's not full stack, it's only front end. And that was a good mm -hmm. idea uh, for the corporate world where they try to decouple the stuff. Like, you know, there's API layer that's protected by super nerdy people who just think that they're like, you know, best coders in the world. And, and, and then there is like a web client, Android client and etc. So nobody ever wanted to have full stack world because like, why would you want it? Uh, even if you build full stack app, you have to build another app on Android that consumes that API. So there's no full stack app if you look at the world now. Like you would have to create clients on other languages, right? So hmm. and uh, but with Mars, we managed to have full stack uh, where it's full stack both uh, back end, front end, and mobile apps. So Mars can run on iOS and Android natively as well as on the web. Mm -hmm. mm, let me ask a few questions about the current state, the current stage, the Mars as it. You have the working platform, right? It has ID, it works. Uh, how many projects use Mars today? Um, what's the nearest future? What are your plans for the 2023? You said you need a lot of microbes created by the community. Mm -hmm. what, what's your next steps for the near, nearest future? Yeah, I will start. I'll start with status. So uh, last year in uh, in spring last year, we had Mars Tree running with uh, over two hundred projects on it, and some projects were uh, quite big with millions of uh, users a month. So basically, we were in a, in a place where we are uh, using just word of mouth without any proper marketing 
uh, we managed to come to a place where we had decent number of projects that were serious enough to say that uh, our concept works. Uh, it saves time. It's performant. Uh, it saves even more time moving forward because that was one of the key here that I never mm. want to build a platform that's good for MVPs only. Like that, mm. that was my, uh, you know, that that was my wor worst ni nightmare. I want to have a platform that helps you. Uh, you know, grow your software because I was mm -hmm. in a place where I had to move my MVPs to the you know higher level. So that's where yeah, we were. I understand building MVPs is fun and easy, but maintaining projects. <laughs> that's yeah, what I that's, don't like. that's where the problem comes. So some people come and tell to me like, "Look, you know, I can build this stuff on React, on Vue, on Django, on whatever." I'm, I'm like, "Yeah, if you know some platform really well, you can build stuff really fast there." But tell me, uh, come back later when it's launched, <laughs> when when you get into the bugs, when you get into the maintenance and the features, yeah. you start changing stuff and everything like you know this uh, depth uh, and all those things. Uh, when you, I still use Django two point seven because um, if I upgrade, <laughs> you just break all. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the people who have had enough experience with uh, with maintaining software with small group of people, they know that that is difficult. If you build software, you leave it there, and you come back uh, after a year, it it won't work. Uh, you know, some things have changed in the world. So you have to you know <laughs> improve it, and uh, so we were there, and, and and then we decided that we have to make. Uh, we have to make Mars 4. And Mars 4 has to be uh, this uh, decent platform that can be opened up for the public. Because Mars 3 was not the platform we could open for the public because it was very high uh, threshold to enter. It was uh, very uh, not intuitive. It worked really well for cases where people trusted us. They learned it. They put time on it because they trust it, but the world wouldn't trust. So we, we decided that we have to uh, rebuild the whole Mars from ground up. Uh, and we collected 273 mm. uh, feedback mm. points from developers. Like really, it's like it's the longest feedback list you can ever have. Like you know, I, I, and every feedback point was like a like a sent like a page. And mm -hmm. we went on uh, rebuilding it, uh, and that's what what we're doing now. Uh, and we're coming to the end of this process, uh, <clears throat> and the, the new Mars Four works uh, so well. And uh, you know, like we have uh, managed to squeeze in almost everything I thought we will only manage to build in the next four years, like. You know, we had this master plan where where a lot of things we had ten versions, so that's why it's Mars X. X is ten in in where is it Arabic or Greek, L L Latin? Yeah, it's ten. So mm -hmm. we had ten versions, and the version number ten was kind of the final where the whole <laughs> world ends. Uh, and I think <laughs> now we managed to put uh, at least three versions within one release. That's not the best thing to do you should you know release more often rather than you know trying to build everything before you release but we were not in the process like if it was the beginning that would be a mistake but in a place where now where we have mars 3 running uh and we have developers using it i felt like there's no point for us to release you know this uh, draft versions I know what has to be done. Mm -hmm. It's clear. It's been four years. Mm -hmm. I learned mm -hmm. from feedback. It's clear feedback from developers, all obvious. So I just have to, you know, uh, fix all the feedback I got first before I bring it back to developers. And that's what we did. And then AI came in and we had AI, uh, you know, we we use AI since uh, GPT-2, like since 2019, when it was not that smart as it was now. And, and I thought like it will get this smart uh, somewhere in 2027. So I thought like we were going to bring AI to Mars in, in, in 27. And suddenly it gets super smart with GPT 3.5 release. And I thought, all right, we have to do it earlier. So that also postponed our release. So we had to quickly put it in earlier than, than expected. So now we're 
we are finishing up uh, mostly UX work with the IDE. Uh, so the whole engine works really well. Uh, and uh, we are using, as always, Mars to build itself. So the first test project of Mars, it's own ID that's built on Mars. And so unlike many other no-code, low-code projects, Mars is built on Mars. What does it mean? It means that, uh, first of all, we as creators of Mars can test Mars really fast. Like we, we can test uh, the whole platform. Mm. Mm, you while your own dog food. Yes, exactly. And that's really important mm -hmm. because imagine the, the feedback loop if we had to build some code, yeah. push it and wait until developers give us feedback. But now we get feedback yeah. straight after uh, we use it ourselves. But even more important thing here is that we can, uh, we can crowdsource Mars itself because in order to... Uh, modify Mars, you do not have mm -hmm. to, you know, clone Git, Git repo or anything like that. You you simply have to uh, find the right place you want to add it inside of your project and add it. So basically, when you run your project, you run entire Mars. Mm -hmm. An entity of Mars. Exactly. And you can mm -hmm. edit anything within Mars when you use it for your own projects. Same as you can edit microapps, but Mars is a microapp itself. IDE is a microapp. Like you showed now IDE, like that drop down up there, that's like all the microapps you mm -hmm. use. And one of the microapps is IDE. So, and, and isn't that mm -hmm. cool? Like, like developers uh, always consume IDEs, but now developers can actually uh, improve it. They can improve the way you know the snippets work, mm -hmm. the way uh, IntelliSense works, the the way they write code. You know, like they can improve everything, and people do that. Like we see, you know, one thing we're most proud about is that almost everybody who ever used Mars has contributed. Like even mm -hmm. junior developers. So if you look at the Mars code for Mars Core. And for mm -hmm. the clients and for IDE, uh, every person who ever touched Mars has at least few lines of code in, in there. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that's, that I'm most proud about because, mm -hmm. you know, it means that you can actually make a, a system that makes it so simple to contribute that everybody contributes and it doesn't matter what's their level of coding because everybody has good ideas in at some moments and if threshold is low and if it's easy to add and it's not risky to break everything uh, people do add things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i can understand that people naturally want to become part of a community they want to contribute to something especially if it's big and ambitious as Mars. And I myself, when I started learning how to program, I saw that advice. Hey, to learn programming, you can contribute to an open source project. That's so fun and easy, yay. And uh, so I tried to do that. <laughs> that was nearly impossible because um, first, you when you start, you are really unsure about your skills and you are afraid that your code will be blamed and shamed <laughs> and yeah. GitHub will ban you because of your code. And then there are a lot of uh, pull requests and issues and uh, like hundreds of them and uh, how to get noticed, what, what to do. Um, it's too, uh, you, the start is too hard, was too hard to, to me because I didn't know how Git works and what's what was that? Just git clone this rep What's that? I don't mm -hmm. know. I just want to throw, throw in some code from my head to this cool stuff. But that was impossible. Um, so if you claim that in Mars it's easy, that means it will improve like times faster, both Mars and the ecosystem of microbes. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, even uh, you're right. Like this, uh, 
I don't want to say that maybe some people will be offended, but I think uh, the open source community is really gated community. It's, it's very protected by the people who are contributing a lot. So it's almost like you either mm. contribute like to 100 projects and you are very famous and cool and everybody respects you, uh, or you just have no chance. It's almost like the winner takes it all. Yeah. Like it's very rare when, when you see people doing little contributions. Obviously, why? Because it's, a, it's similar to when I was studying in university. Uh, in one university, the culture was that the people who were a bit uh, higher up in, you know, PhD, etc., they were so uh, snobby, like they wouldn't even talk to the younger students. And I felt like, why? You know, it's not necessarily that you're smarter. Like some younger students are obviously smarter than some older students uh, or mm -hmm. older even professors sometimes, not all. Mm -hmm. And same here. And I think uh, what I want to achieve here, I want, in a, I, I want to enable, you know, everybody uh, to be able to contribute and to, you know, to, to have code that lives forever. Because I think one, one sad and tragedy of the developer world is that uh, for most developers, almost all of their code just vanishes away um, mm. with the projects it goes to like you know you, you, it's just yeah. you have written 100,000 lines of code and it's very high chance that zero of those lines exist anymore more than somewhere in github in the that yeah. project that went bankrupt or you know no financing and that's sad mm -hmm. I think that's very sad yeah you either have to be a good marketer to promote your github repository or become an entrepreneur and make something useful that people, you, again, you have to be a marketer. <laughs> yeah, that's all, all the, you know, statistics, like, you know, some, some people will, but I don't like, you know, this concept that where only the winners get everything. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's good for society that everybody gets mm -hmm. based on their, uh, you know, mm -hmm based on their resources. Like if you have put time and effort mm -hmm. <clears throat> and did something, uh, it must not be, you know, thrown away. And, yeah. uh, and the culture where in order to, you know, be noticed, you have to be the best. It's good for the best guys, but not everybody wants yeah. to be the best because it's sacrificing a lot, like family, friends, everything. Uh, and yeah. also it's not healthy for the society. I think it's good for society that, that everybody who wants to put effort can get the reward. The effort has to be rewarded. Mm. Can we use this your philosophy of how Marx, Mars works and apply it to the entire world? For example, uh, I'm afraid of what Spotify did with musicians. Again, top 1% get all the money while <laughs> the rest of artists have to work as couriers and, uh, of, of, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, you uh, definitely watched that movie, right? Uh, the Netflix series, the, the playlist. Which one? Oh, you haven't. No, you I have don't. to watch the playlist. It's Norwegian or Swedish movie. Really good. Uh, I watched it uh, in Swedish. Like, it's... Mm, Amazing. You, okay. uh, yeah, and uh, after I watched that, it was very, uh, you know, I opening for me. It's very important. Was really important. Their mm -hmm. their vision was very similar to ours. They wanted to bring in the artists. They wanted to you know take care of the artists, and mm -hmm. they they wanted to take away uh, artists from labels where only few artists make money and others don't. But they ended up screwing up the artists even more than than before they came in and that's something uh, really interesting mm -hmm. and something i i try to learn and understand and make sure that we don't get into there uh, and uh, for us it's easier because we are not in very protected industry like the code <laughs> is has been already democratized uh, in 97 when the GNU Foundation and when the Linux and open source world has made a revolution mm -hmm. and uh, convinced the world mm -hmm. that software doesn't have to be 
same as you know this uh, you yeah. know music etc and movies with rights etc so software can be free or people can decide what to do with it so and then uh, i think for for us uh, since we're digital uh, and since we're all around code uh, one of my vision is that we have to invent a way where mars becomes more than a platform where mars becomes a decentralized uh, entity that's uh, co-owned by everybody who is uh, contributing into it so that uh, if mars succeeds if there is value being created within mars then all the contributors will get the share of the value and uh, and then the question uh, whether you know it will happen same with, with spotify where few artists get all the value well, we have mm-hmm. to think about that before that that happens and make some uh, some system around it so that it doesn't happen. Like I don't think that I don't think that the money will have to be uh, the way to reward the best developers. Mm-hmm. In the community. I think there will be other things we can reward them with uh, with money as well. But mm-hmm. not only. So I would mm. say in, in, in Spotify, 99% of all revenue goes to 1% of the singers. I think in mm-hmm. Mars, it will be a lot more uh, equal. Not equal. Mm. It depends on your um, uh, contribution. Mm-hmm. But it will be much more equal than in Spotify. But still, there will be 1% of people who are kind of champions. That happens everywhere, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. these champions will get certain things. Uh, such as uh, you know maybe decision power within Mars community to decide uh, about uh, you know certain uh, things and in the future they will mm-hmm. have more of it um, and mm-hmm. other kind of perks rather mm-hmm. than financial. Mm-hmm. So you can benefit not only the programmers who brought the biggest value, but also the programmers who tested a lot of time and tried their best. But still, their microbes are not used widely. Yes, exactly. Because you never know. Uh, it's same with Spotify, right? You never know why uh, why Taylor Swift is so popular on, on Spotify. Is it because of Taylor Swift, or is it because mm-hmm. um, there were singers before her who made that service popular, right? And and and, and now she is cashing out on 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 the previous foundation of the popularity of the service from the previous singers, right? So I think uh, in the creative art, it's really complicated to actually uh, measure the impact because there is no direct impact here. Uh, And in Mars, it will be even more difficult. In Spotify, at least you have the tracks and people listen to them. But in Mars, Mm -hmm. I may end up using, you know, uh, 500 microbes because I use mm-hmm. 20 and those 20 use 20 each and suddenly 20 by 20 is 400, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so it will, it, it will be pretty much, you know, everything will be shuffled and merged and, you know, intersecting in one way and the or the other. So we will have to invent some way how to measure it, but most mm-hmm. likely we will have a system where um, we will try to, uh, we will ha- try to have some bottom line where all contributors will be receiving decent, uh, uh, you know, either pay or whatever we're going to p- provide. Uh, mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter uh, how often their apps are used, but then mm-hmm. there will be s- a system to reward the people who are actually promoting Mars, who are clearly moving it forward. Uh, so basically, it, it's more like, you know, if you think about the governmental structure, you know, we'll have certain universal basic income. Uh, and then on to- that, that will go to everyone who is part of the platform. Uh, and then mm-hmm. on top of that, for some of the champions who do more than the others, and that's clear, uh, there will be extra benefits. So it will be kind of, you know, a mix of this uh, little uh, universal basic income plus regular market Mm -hmm. where the winners get more but the uh, not the losers but the not winners uh, Mm -hmm. also (laughs) can be sure about their future because look at ai now who has invented this not open ai Uh, Mm -hmm. it's universities 
You know, GPT has been invented in 2017 by two researchers. Um, and, and everything in the world has been invented in universities. All programming languages, everything almost. Uh, and it was commercialized by the companies. Why it was invented in the universities? Because people were kind of, uh, you know, uh, feeling safe. They had scholarships. They had, the, you know, certain wage or academic pay that was mm -hmm. making them, uh, you know, not being too busy to yeah. find ways to make money. And they were actually making things they, uh, they believe in. And I, and I want the same thing happen in Mars. I don't want everybody to come in and build one micro app that's the most mm -hmm. hyped this week, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like if you look at the indie world, I like indie world, but I also dislike mm -hmm. indie world because of that. Mm -hmm. And the whole indie world jumps on hype from and then to the next hype, to the next hype, not entire, but a lot of it. And, and why? Because it's possible to make money. But I think it makes more sense for people to do something because they are good at it, not because it's popular today. If we get mm -hmm. there, uh, then we'll have a lot more good things in the world, a lot more good software and in the concept of Mars, a lot more good micro apps so that every micro will be really good because people who build those micro apps they will be pretty confident on their, their future. They will be building those microbes. They won't be jumping out and in to all the pop, popular Web3, AI, NFT kind of things. They will be kind of sticking to their thing mm -hmm. for many years. Mm -hmm. I, I really like what you say. And uh, if I were just a stranger, I would be totally sold by this moment. <laughs> so uh, imagine I am a regular programmer just a guy who works at i don't know a regular a regular company and i code javascript for life and i want to contribute to mars because i like what you say uh, what do i do uh, tell me steps by steps go here or maybe not today but when mars x is ready for the public go here do that uh, how much time what exactly do i need do i need to code uh, do I need to be a good programmer to start? Mm -hmm. uh, can I contribute in an other way than coding? For example, documentation, promotion, as you said. Or what will I get for that? Will it be just respect or money or what? Yeah. Just uh, imagine I'm a programmer who wants to get in. What do I do? Uh, we will. We will be figuring out this as we go. And if... Mm -hmm. First thing I would say, if anyone has good idea how to do this, come up mm. with it, right? So th that's the first thing I would say. Uh, even that is open for discussion. Even the discussion itself is open for discussion, right? Uh, but uh, easy steps. Uh, we're running on Discord, so we try to have Discord as our primary source uh, of uh, communication. So mm -hmm. join our Discord, join our waitlist, and the waitlist uh, sends you to Discord. Right? And in Discord, introduce yourself, uh, introduce uh, your background, etc., so that uh, it's clear uh, what you know, what what you've done, and. Uh, mm -hmm. It's clear for everyone and also for for the core team. And then uh, about the level, uh, as I said earlier, like most of Mars was created, most code in Mars has been written by the people who are not experienced programmers. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it was uh, very democratized. So you don't have to be a really experienced programmer. I don't really believe in experience. I have to have experience because I have to understand big picture and that's that needs experience because you just can't have you can't be wise about this if you don't know almost everything about the development world languages know all those things and I would never come up with this idea five years ago uh, because I, I haven't had enough no, you know experience and wisdom back then but uh, there are a lot of ways to contribute. You know, people can contribute by creating, uh, you know, UI libraries, by improving IDE, by Im improving any existing micro app, uh, mm -hmm. by promoting it, by designing something in Figma, and uh, you know, uh, helping us to improve the design based on that mockup, uh, by mm -hmm. improving the copy, 
the text by finding better icons uh, for the place where we have icons, like pretty much everything. So I, I, I don't think there's any threshold at all. Uh, the only requirement here is that you're curious person who wants to do that. Like if you have the motivation to do this in general, uh, then that's the filter we have. Uh, I believe that, that that's enough to be useful. Obviously, if you have you know, one year experience, you won't be contributing into the engine that transpiles JavaScript into the you know, other mm-hmm. thing. Uh, but mm-hmm. there are a lot of things and there are a lot of simpler things, medium and, and complicated. Uh, so pretty much uh, everyone will mm-hmm. find something to contribute with. And then when it comes to rewards, we're thinking about different mm-hmm. models uh, where definitely we're going to have uh, uh, cash rewards. Definitely. We're going to mm-hmm. run this uh, similar to, as I said, to the research, to the universities, where uh, for younger people, who don't have steady income yet, uh, we will be providing uh, certain you know, grants or scholarships uh, mm-hmm. to you know, improve and to research within Mars. Like uh, for for older people, for for those who already have uh, some side income, I think that should not be that important. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I guess for, for for them, I would say we would provide. Uh, help uh, with uh, uh, with with visibility. So we will promote them whenever we can, wherever you can. Uh, we will uh, try to bring in users for their microbes if they create microbes. So I think it's a, it's a mix. It's a mix of uh, uh, some cash, uh, some uh, promotion from us for mm-hmm. these people. In our channels, mm-hmm. in our you know streams, podcasts, anywhere, uh, newsletters, um, and mm-hmm. and all other sorts of things that uh, that one can do for the community, you know, such as mm-hmm. uh, t-shirts, uh, mugs, uh, trips. Yeah, you know, t-shirts. my my favorite thing about business is is corporate trips. So I think by end of twenty three, or or maybe even summer 23, we will do that. We will have a big Mars uh, summit where we're going to just bring everyone in and have a big party. So, yeah, what else? And the last thing, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, that we are looking into the ways how to make, uh, how to, uh, you know, give the most important contributors, or even maybe to the all contributors, some kind of stake in Mars. So mm. we're figuring out how to do that exactly. You know, uh, is it stocks? Is it uh, certain, you know, uh, internal coins or, or 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 points that can convert it into the stock? Or so we have a lot mm-hmm. of ideas there, but there is uh, uh, in making. So the ambition <laughs> is to eventually. Uh, have a clear structure here that um, you know that developer can come into the Mars ecosystem and and will feel safe to the rest of his life. Right, he will just mm-hmm. build the stuff mm-hmm. he likes, make useful code for the others, and make money on that, and never work uh, with things he doesn't like ever again because everybody has something they like. But now they do whatever they have paid for. But we want mm-hmm. them to do what they like. And then uh, eventually, you know, every task will find somebody who likes it. Mm-hmm. One addition is that Mars uses AI actively. So if you're curious about AI and especially the utility of UI in programming, you can start getting familiar with that by using Mars X and playing with the micro apps which are connected to AI, you don't need to learn some hardcore things like how GPT works or how language models works. You can start with just playing with simple forms created by AI and uh, get yourself prepared for the next generation. 
Oh yeah, I play a lot with the, with that. I built uh, tonight. I built Discord bot that can summarize uh, chats into the tasks. Next so time fun. you hide the address bar, and we will do a lot of demonstrations. <laughs> yeah, let's have an, a, another uh, session next week. We can do yes, next please. week or the week after. Next week is uh, the Valent. No, it's not Valentine's Day. Okay, we can do it next week. Only yeah. demo, only software, only code. Yeah, let's let's do more calls. Gonna I be, believe people we're going to turn off the microphones. It's going to be silent, uh, only code mode. Yeah. <laughs> Let the call to talk for us. I I think we, we can slowly come to the end. It has been a lot of time we are talking here. We are not really um com uh, attractive persons, I guess. Like I, I would I would not love to stare at myself for one hour. Um, you know, <laughs> same for you. Sorry. So to all the crowd who are seeing us at this moment, that's free people. Thank you. And we will put this video on YouTube and LinkedIn. You can watch it later. And again, we will meet with John in the future, like in a week, and do a lot of coding. Um, that would be much more fun than just talking, I guess. But I re really like that you have such big and ambitious ideas. And what I especially adore is that you can tell all the little details of your plan. Like your vision is so solid. It's complex, but you like know every piece of this in advance. Um, you know, <laughs> you're yeah, not, it's, uh, it's like a you're a visionary with a plan. Before. Yeah. That's a rare combination. I have to maybe write it down and it will be probably 100 pages. Uh, detailed um, plan. I have I it, by the way. Point. I have the master plan in Google Doc. It's it's very lot of text. I will send it to you after I run it through AI so that it doesn't look messy <laughs> because now it's a lot of text. It's so good with AI. You can just you know convert messy stuff into structured stuff. <laughs> okay, I will ask AI to summarize it and read it to me <laughs> <laughs> and write a reply to you. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Okay, so, thanks for your time, then. Thank you for the conversation. Bye.